The Legend of Korra is a really interesting show. Not because it has amazing themes or engaging characters or great world building, but actually because it doesn't have any of those things. The show doesn't really do anything well, at least in my opinion. And yet, people absolutely love this show. Even people who recognize that it's not as good as The Last Airbender think it's a high quality show. And it's just really weird to me. I mean, I get enjoying the nostalgia of watching another Avatar show, but The Legend of Korra gets so much credit for being innovative and mature compared to Airbender when it's inferior in every single way by a huge margin. I don't think Korra deserves any credit, really, because it doesn't do anything special in general, but especially not compared to Airbender. So why do people want to like The Legend of Korra, and why does it miss the mark so badly? We have to start at the beginning, with Avatar The Last Airbender, because The Legend of Korra just doesn't exist without it. That show is important not just because it was a good show that established the Avatar world, it also happens to be one of the greatest TV shows ever made. It is a perfect case study in world building, writing, emotional engagement, character development, theme integration, you name it, Airbender does it really, really well. It is a show that just does everything right and manages to tell beautiful stories in a way that resonates with everyone across every age group. The show's characters are all incredible and feel real, and the rest of the world is basically built around them to maximize the emotional impact of their stories. All of the bending, the history, the mythology, and even the cities and people in the world itself are all specifically there to give the main characters an opportunity to grow or to solidify traits they have. Every single episode furthers the character's emotional growth. Even filler episodes flesh out the characters in meaningful ways. The purpose is difficult, or arguably impossible, to determine if you're not a creator of a piece of media. But as a viewer, it seems like the creators of Airbender were really deliberate about what aspects of the world they chose to flesh out, and how exactly they went about doing it to always give the characters an opportunity to grow and learn and develop. None of this is to discount how wondrous the world of Avatar is on its own. There are plenty of parts of the world that are really cool and creative and exciting regardless of anything else in the show. But I think that the world takes on a greater meaning because of how it interacted with the characters that we fell in love with over the course of the show. And this was the legacy that The Legend of Korra tried to continue. Obviously this wasn't a simple task, but I think the expectation for Korra wasn't to be as good as Airbender, but to have a similar fundamental quality. The shows had the same creators, so the hope was that the characters and world would still be really strong, especially with such a strong foundation to build off. But, as I've already mentioned, that didn't happen. There's a couple of things I need to address before I continue regarding The Legend of Korra. First of all, Korra had a really difficult development. The show was originally supposed to be a miniseries, but even then the network temporarily stopped production of Korra early on before they even aired because they were worried that nobody would want to watch a show with a female protagonist. As the show became a full series, production stayed really messy. The show had its budget cut in the middle of its run, and there was a constant threat that the show would be cancelled altogether. So I don't really blame the show for its technical problems, like its animation quality, because I understand that was mostly beyond the creator's control. Second, I don't think the show is a failure for being worse than The Last Airbender, because it's kind of insane to not expect that to be the case. Airbender was a masterpiece, and it's really hard to do anything that good even once in your life. I would have been fine with a show that was worse than the original, but still good. So with all of that said, my biggest issue with The Legend of Korra is that its writing is awful. I personally think that the strength of a piece of media and the main way it can actually be resonant is in having strong character growth. Humans engage really strongly with stories that they can relate to and see themselves in even in a story like The Lord of the Rings, which is widely considered to have one of the most thoroughly fleshed out world histories of any piece of media ever created, and is best known for having orcs and wizards and elves and hobbits, even that only became successful because of how strong its characters were. Writing a world that's magical and different from ours isn't actually that difficult. Any six-year-old can create a world with unicorns and dwarves and talking whales. But what makes stories stand out is in having their characters feel human, and having them evolve and grow and face challenges just like we do in real life. That's also what made Airbender so special, but The Legend of Korra seems to have completely missed that. Most of the time, it seems like the creators don't even know what to do with any of the characters they created. By episode 8 of a 52 episode show, three of the six main characters have nothing to do anymore, two of the other characters sort of just blip in and out, and the last character is Korra, and she also doesn't really do anything either. I mean, she certainly does things, but everything she does is completely pointless, both for the plot and for her own growth. Korra starts the show reckless, combative, impatient, and self-important. 
She thinks that as the avatar, she deserves to be treated special by important people, and she thinks that the solution to every problem is to run in headfirst and fight everyone she sees. Now, I actually really like that Korra starts out like this. She is the exact opposite of Aang from Airbender. Aang was a pacifist, didn't like fighting with people, and was extremely reluctant to take on any responsibility and interfere with other people he didn't understand. Korra being exactly the opposite gives her a lot of room to grow and to learn lessons that Aang would have never even addressed. So that's her starting point. Season 1 opens with Korra traveling to Republic City for the first time in her life. Republic City is a major modern metropolitan city, and the only one of its kind in the world. Korra goes there because she needs to master all of the elements, and the only airbender in the world lives there. However, during the time she arrives, there's a lot of corruption, and gangs of benders are abusing helpless non-benders. This leads to a lot of anti-bender sentiment among non-benders, to the point where an extremist founds the Equalist Movement, which is a terrorist organization aiming to rid the world of bending. So there's already a lot of good stuff here. Korra's now in a city that doesn't really know her at all, and therefore doesn't think she's that special, with a culture that is sort of anti her entire existence, and she needs to help calm people down and make them feel safe. At the same time, she needs to learn airbending, which is an element that is very focused on spirituality and flexibility, two traits that Korra doesn't have at all. On top of all of this, one of the senators is using the equalist threat as an opportunity to consolidate power to make himself essentially a dictator, and is taking advantage of Korra's lack of real-world experience to trick her into working with him, since he's the only one who actually treats her like she's special. So far, this all sounds like a fantastic setting for this story to take place. The world is clearly set up in a way so that Korra needs to grow and mature in difficult ways in order to solve the crisis and come out victorious. Great setup so far! And then Korra proceeds to spend the first two-thirds of the season futzing around with some homeless people she met in an MMA tournament, yelling at her airbending teacher a bunch, causing a lot of property damage, and getting her ass kicked a lot. Now, normally you would have this stuff happen so that Korra can fail in order to realize that she needs to grow. But throughout all of this, Korra is completely convinced that she hasn't done anything wrong, so she thinks she has no reason to change. But eight episodes into the show, she still doesn't know airbending, she still hasn't done anything to even inconvenience the Equalists, and she hasn't grown at all. At the end of the eighth episode, Korra finally realizes that the evil senator is actually evil, and then he immediately captures her. Now, imprisoned and left with literally nothing else to do, she decides it's finally time to start meditating. Through meditating, she gets a vision from her past life that warns her that the evil senator is evil and dangerous. Helpful. And then, out of nowhere, the terrorist shows up and accidentally frees her, and she runs home to tell everyone what happened and to figure out what to do. Meanwhile, the terrorist takes away the evil senator's bending, captures all of the other senators, and then declares himself supreme leader of the city. Then he holds some rallies to take away people's bending. At this point, we have less than three episodes left in the season. Korra finally decided to meditate, which technically counts as being spiritual and technically counts as growth, I guess, but she's still impatient and headstrong, and still doesn't think anything through, and still thinks the solution to every problem is to beat up whoever disagrees with her. At this point, she'll have to realize that she can't just run at the terrorists straight on, right? Because so far, her running straight into battle every time has exclusively led to disaster, right? Well, after some deliberation, Korra and her friends decide that the best course of action is to run up to the bad guy in the middle of a huge rally he's holding, filled with equalists, and yell at him. To be fair, Korra did try to call in the army to deal with the terrorists, but then the army immediately got blown up, so that literally didn't matter at all and just served to waste an entire episode. And right after that, Korra found the evil senator in prison, who told her he and the terrorists are actually brothers, which took another whole episode to explain, which is why she got the idea to yell at the terrorists in front of a crowd. Now, despite the fact that this plan was clearly well thought out and had no flaws whatsoever, nobody believes her. And then the terrorist chases her down and takes her bending away, leaving her unconscious. I, I just... There are so many things Korra could have done to confront the terrorist. And somehow, she chose the worst possible option again. It's just... Actually, you know what? Given everything else that's happened in the show, this situation actually makes perfect sense because all we've seen so far is all the ways Korra is completely incompetent. Every time Korra has tried to do anything this entire season, she ends up getting captured, or the bad guy ends up getting away, or she just doesn't achieve anything, and then something out of her control comes in and completely invalidates everything that happened up to that point. Korra gets arrested, her airbending teacher happens to be friends with the police chief, and gets her out. Korra is about to get captured by some equalists, her polar bear comes in out of nowhere and scares them off. Cory gets knocked unconscious by an invincible robot. Her friends sneak in and rescue her. Cory gets knocked unconscious by the terrorist himself. He just decides to not capture her for a completely stupid reason. 
Cora gets captured by the senator, the terrorist accidentally frees her. There have been no real consequences, good or bad, for any of Cora's actions. She isn't even injured from all of this. And maybe that's also why Cora literally hasn't learned anything or grown at all in this entire season. Maybe this was all deliberate. Maybe the writers are trying to make a point that the consequences of our actions aren't actually up to us, but are based on events that are far beyond our control. Maybe they're showing us that the world is so big and filled with people with enormous amounts of money and influence that have their own agendas that can't be stopped by random people or even figureheads. For whatever we try, we are all just grains of sand being carried around by the waves of power that a select few individuals wield mercilessly and without regard for human life. Or maybe this is just bad writing. Alright, there's 7 minutes in the season left. Let's see what random thing that Korra has no control over decides to show up and save her. After a short chase scene, Korra wakes up and accidentally airbends the terrorist out of the building. Which, fine. She hasn't airbended it all up until now, and she's barely figured out any of the airbending techniques, and her bending was locked, but fine, she could just fucking airbend for no goddamn reason, even though you had an entire season that could have been used to show her learning airbending that was instead spent showing Asami driving cars! And as if it couldn't get any more stupid, the terrorist ends up falling into the ocean and has to water bend out of it instead of swimming like a normal person, and he does it in front of a bunch of people that he should have realized would be there, and that is apparently enough to convince the entire city that the equalist should disband. But then he runs away in disgrace with his brother, the evil senator, who decides to commit murder-suicide. The season ends with Korra getting her bending back through magic, which the show helpfully explains with the previously established go fuck yourself, the writers don't owe you an explanation, fuck you for asking corollary of the Avatar universe, and now Korra can use the same magic to give other people their bending back, which she does for one person, and then calls it a day. So Korra went around achieving nothing and learning nothing for 11 and a half episodes until she accidentally pushes the bad guy out of a building, and she doesn't even kill or capture him. She managed to learn airbending without learning airbending, but doesn't even feel like she had anything else to learn, because look, she won. The bad guy is dead. It was all worth it. Even though the Equalist straight up took over the entire city, and the bad senator straight up turned the city into a police state, and there's still crime gangs beating up helpless civilians, and Korra doesn't actually even know that the terrorist died now that I think about it. By all accounts, she didn't succeed in a single thing she was supposed to do coming into the city. But the season ends on a triumphant note anyway, and all the characters say everything worked out and that Korra did a good job. I just don't understand this. What was the point of any of this? Nothing that happened in the season mattered at all. Nothing changed, nobody grew, there were no consequences to anything that happened. It was just a complete waste of time. Korra certainly didn't grow or change. She's still exactly the same person she was at the start of the season, except now she can also airbend, which she learned by magic. There's not even a message for the audience to take away, because the bad things kept happening no matter what Korra or any of the characters did, but every bad thing that happened to them got reversed, usually in the same fucking episode. From the moment Korra arrived in Republic City, every minute of every episode was just filler to get to the scene where she faces off against the terrorist, and then she doesn't even actually beat him. He beats himself out of sheer stupidity, and then his brother fucking kills him. Nothing important happens aside from that that differentiates the world at the beginning and at the end. So the entire first season of The Legend of Korra consists of Korra doing stupid things constantly, never reflecting on her decisions, and everything working out for her because the writers just fucking say it does. And this problem isn't exclusive to season one. It is the driving force behind everything that happens throughout the entire rest of the show. I don't think Korra really succeeds in anything she does for the entire series. When things work out, it's always because other people did the work for her and she just happened to be there. In Season 2, there's a quote-unquote civil war between the Northern and Southern Water Tribes. Korra's from the Southern Water Tribe, by the way. Where the leader of the North says the South needs to merge with them to be safe. Even though the leader looks completely evil and exclusively says evil things, Korra decides to trust him because, as we've seen so far, Korra's an idiot. And she basically just helps him take over her home because, as we've established, Korra is completely incompetent. She also gets beat up by a bunch of dark spirits because this wouldn't be the Legend of Korra if there weren't pointless fight scenes where Korra gets beat up. There's this theme that Korra's supposed to be more educated as the Avatar and not get involved if she doesn't know what's happening, or something along those lines, but it doesn't really matter because Korra basically doesn't do anything after the third episode in the season because she gets knocked out for a few episodes, and then fucks around in the spirit world for a bit until eventually the bad guy turns into a giant monster, and then Korra has to turn into a giant monster, and then they fight. And even then, Korra's going to lose until one of her friends turns into an angel and basically kills the bad guy herself. Then the Civil War is apparently solved, and everyone is happy. 
So again, Cora didn't actually have to learn anything to fix the problem. Someone else ended up fixing the problem for her, and the solution was just to fight, and she wins because she's special and the show needs her to win. She also opens the spirit portals, which is a whole bullshit can of worms that I am not ready to talk about yet. In Season 3, the main threat is an anarchist who decides he wants to kidnap Korra because she's the Avatar and he hates her on principle, and he also wants to kill all of the major world leaders. Korra proceeds to get kidnapped three times this season, and ends up getting saved by her friends all three times, and then some escaped Earth Kingdom prisoners kill the anarchist in the end after Korra gets tortured too badly to be able to fight properly. There's a vague theme about the Avatar's duty or whatever, but Korra does all of her Avatar stuff with a bunch of other people who aren't the Avatar who end up doing most of the work anyway. So her being the Avatar doesn't actually matter, except to give the Anarchist a reason to hate her. Season 4 is the one where people argue Korra does grow and learn, but even then only in a really cheap way that ultimately amounts to nothing. She starts Season 4 with straight up post-traumatic stress disorder, because she got tortured and poisoned so badly at the end of last season. Now, I don't really love this being Korra's arc this season, because PTSD is fucking brutal. PTSD isn't about feeling scared because something happened that you can just get over. It's when you go through something so horrific and traumatic that it literally breaks your brain's coping mechanisms. It can take years to fully recover from it, if you ever do. So giving a character PTSD and making their arc just getting over it isn't really realistic and doesn't make for a great plot. And even though Korra has an episode showing her going through therapy, in the end the solution is to be yelled at by a bunch of old people until she decides she's fine in the second to last episode. Even if this wasn't meant to be PTSD, even though it definitely is, it's literally textbook PTSD, and Korra just needs to get over her fears or something, she doesn't actually do that. She doesn't learn anything about herself or have to face some deeper issue with herself or her mentality in life. She just has to realize that, yeah, it's scary to get hurt so badly you almost died multiple times, but that was a while ago and it's getting old, so it's time to get over yourself. That's still not growth, and it's still an unhealthy representation of mental health issues and victims of abuse. And by the way, while she has PTSD, she still just ends up running into battle and fighting people to solve all of her problems, or, you know, fail constantly. Sure, there is an episode where she realizes that she shouldn't fight to solve her problems, and that she should try to talk it out to negotiate a solution, but once again, the show takes an opportunity for growth and just chucks it out the window like a fucking shot put, and Korra just has to fight the main bad guy anyway, and of course she gets her ass kicked again. So, to sum up, she doesn't really learn anything, and if she does, it's that eventually everything will come down to fighting, so why even bother trying anything else? Oh, and also in the last scene of the show, Korra holds hands with her female friend as they walk into a portal together, which apparently means that she's gay now. So Korra ends up pretty much exactly where she was in episode 1, except she might potentially be attracted to women, maybe. And it's not just that every plan she had failed, or that she didn't end up helping pretty much anyone, or that she ended up making everything worse every time she tried to get involved, well, okay, well actually it is those things. But also, Korra, the main character in a show called The Legend of Korra, could have been replaced by a MacGuffin, and the show would have been exactly the same. And I mean exactly the same. Anytime Korra does something that affects the plot, her friends are all always there for completely unrelated reasons, and you could really easily just take Korra out and have them do exactly what she does using a magic spirit key. That's sort of what happens half of the time anyway. To be absolutely fair, Korra isn't the only character with this problem, She's definitely the worst, because she's the main character of the show, but none of the other main characters change or do that much either. You can sum up each of the other arcs for the entire show in less than a sentence. Mako gets a job, Bolin gets a job and new powers, that he didn't work for or anything, he just got them. Asami gets a job as head of a company off-screen, Lin forgives her family, and Tenzin learns to be more patient. That's not to say these arcs are pointless or anything, because they're substantial, but all of these arcs occur in just two or three episodes. This show has 52 episodes across 4 seasons, so this just doesn't cut it. All of the main characters, Korra included, spend the vast majority of the show not really doing anything substantial. But my issues with the show don't end there. If anything, this is just the beginning. I actually think that the severe lack of character depth is a symptom of something else. It really seems like despite the fact that The Last Airbender and Korra were made by the same people, the writers of Korra focused exclusively on showing dark themes instead of having a real story. I don't know if you've personally had this, but I had this phase when I was a teenager where I became obsessed with stories having to be dark and quote unquote mature to be interesting. I always felt like games I played and shows I watched needed to have dark undertones. They needed to be depressing and raw and have meaningful consequences in the world, or else it would be too childish or something. My personal theory is that this happens because as a kid you're just told every story has a happy ending and that everything is always good in the world. But then once you're a teenager, you start coming into contact with the reality that the world isn't always happy in flowers and rainbows. 
So you sort of push hard in the opposite direction to prove you know the truth now or whatever, and that you're a real adult who understands real consequences. But as I grew up, that feeling passed, and now I know that media doesn't have to be dark and depressing to be mature or engaging. There is certainly media that is dark and depressing that is really interesting and different and uses dark experiences to show meaningful human stories, but there's a lot of garbage that just tries to be dark for the sake of being dark and doesn't say anything meaningful. Korra falls into the second category. Season 1 has the rise of the Equalists, a terrorist organization hell-bent on taking away the physical ability of half of the world's inhabitants, because that half is abusing its power on the other powerless half. Republic City is filled with crime, and the government isn't really doing anything about it except to basically side with the criminals. There are themes of corruption, inequality, political instability, police states, and classism just to start with. And those are all real problems that have really difficult solutions that affect every aspect of life, even in the real world. But the writers just sort of throw away all these problems at the end of the season and just say the good guys win. The Equalists, who have enough members to take down the entire police force and an army and have full control of the biggest city in the world at one point, just disband because one guy gets thrown into the ocean and disappears, and I guess that somehow also solves inequality. And it's not like anyone did anything about the crime gangs, they're still just as big of a problem as they were at the start of the season. The city is exactly where it was when the show started, and there are no real consequences for anything that happened. If anything, the show basically goes out of its way to show that actually, all of those non-benders were just overreacting, because look at how many good benders there are! They saved the city from... something! And the Equalists were led by another bender anyway, so everything he said is automatically invalid because he is just evil and inequality wasn't a real problem in the city because it doesn't affect the main character, so I guess everything is okay! Season 2 is almost as bad about it. The Northern Water Tribe tries to conquer the Southern Water Tribe, basically just as a show of strength, and there are a lot of conflicts between the occupied citizens of the South, who are pretty much helpless here, and the aggressors from the North. This kind of thing has a lot of parallels in real life, even as recently as when Russia decided to annex Crimea in 2014. And these are really difficult situations to solve that in most cases are only solved by outside interference or by the aggressor nation crumbling apart because of internal political problems. But in Korra, the problem is solved by Korra and the main villain turning into giant monsters and shooting laser beams at each other until one of them dies. And then, hey, look, everyone else is actually good, and nobody else really wanted to conquer the South. In Season 3, an anarchist literally kills the head of state of the biggest nation in the world, which causes the nation to break up into smaller states. In Season 4, a military commander reunites all of the states and declares herself supreme ruler of the new United Nation. So at least they do address the consequences of that problem. But then, Season 4 ends with a dictator building this ridiculous giant robot, and Korra's friends destroying it. And after they do, the dictator just decides to surrender even though she still has the largest, most technologically advanced army in the history of the world, literally just standing outside the city limits, waiting for orders. And she hasn't lost a single battle ever. She isn't even captured yet at this point, and she's also one of the most power-hungry humans ever, willing to kill her fiancé if it means she wins the war. But they broke her knockoff Power Rangers toy, so I guess there's no point in fighting anymore. Just like in real life, very dark and mature. Season 3 also features Tenzin trying to revive a dead culture but finds himself constantly under attack and having trouble getting people to go along with him. But while in this case the solution is actually realistic in Season 3, where the new members of this culture keep getting targeted and decide that they have to work together and bond over their new shared experience to survive, in Season 4 they become the Flying Squirrel Power Ranger Brigade and just go around giving tours and saving cats from trees or something. Look, like I mentioned earlier, I don't have an issue with shows trying to address dark themes, but the writers of Korra are clearly not capable of writing actual mature stories. I would go so far as to say that the way the writers present these issues is completely disrespectful. Every season, the villain is supposed to live in this gray area, and the show spends the entire first half of each season saying, hey, this guy actually has a point, but then spends the entire second half of the season invalidating everything the villain does, pretending the guy was evil from the start, and ignoring the central problem that allowed the villain to rise to power in the first place. You don't get to have it both ways. You can't act as if your show is somehow smart and dark and nuanced just for pointing out complex socio-political problems, and then turn around and say the solution is always to fight a video game boss. This show isn't mature, these writers aren't smart, and it's insulting that they're trying to trick us into thinking they are. And the real kicker here is that for all of Korra trying so hard to be all dark and stuff because Airbender was supposedly for kids, Airbender was significantly darker and more mature than Korra ever was. The show starts with literal, complete genocide, an entire culture across four continents wiped out of existence, aside from this one fucking 12-year-old who now has no friends or family because they're all systematically executed. His best friends are Sokka and Katara, whose mom got killed in a war raid and their dad had to leave them to fight in the war that killed their mom, so they end up having to raise themselves from the age of eight. 
Their nemesis is a teenager who is exiled from his country at the age of 13 because his dad is an abusive sociopath that also exiled the kid's mom. And on top of all of that, all of these characters are forced to find themselves and take on enormous responsibilities that even adults would struggle with. And that's just the main characters. Airbender also portrays the devastating impact of imperialism and colonialism, shows the effects of prison camps and discrimination in a world divided by war, shows characters whose lives were completely upturned as they were forced to become refugees, searching for a place that would accept them. And in all of these cases, it's not even that the enemies are all sociopaths. I mean, yeah, the Fire Lord is, but all of the soldiers are shown to just be regular people who are just drafted into the military and are doing what they're told because they think what they're doing is right. And what makes the show so impactful is how much it humanizes every person who is impacted by the war. It doesn't just show some picture of a colony or have some character give an exposition dump about some village's history like Korra does. There are entire episodes devoted to meeting these people whose lives have been destroyed by the Fire Nation whose parents were taken prisoner or enslaved because of forces way beyond their control, who just want to feel safe for once in their lives, and how corruption tears villages apart without even encountering any enemies directly. The Last Airbender doesn't just talk about how things are bad, it shows the visceral reality of war and the human consequences of it. And problems aren't just magically solved either. Solutions only come because Aang and his friends are smart, caring, and creative, and find actual ways to address people's problems. There's never a moment in the show where everything goes back to normal by beating a giant whatever with a big laser. Yes, The Last Airbender was made for kids to engage with, but it wasn't just a kid's show. But the writers of Korra somehow didn't see that at all, and instead tried to make plot lines that in theory are nuanced and interesting, but are actually totally stupid and childish. In the end, every socio-political problem boils down to a boss fight that Korra always wins because she has to because the writers said so, even if Korra doesn't do anything right. What's mature or realistic about that? What makes me really angry about Korra's existence though, is that in the process of trying and failing to make a more mature show with more mature themes, they also took a bunch of Airbender's powerful themes and actively ruined them. Almost all of the major themes Airbender tried to establish, or the creative mechanisms the show tried to use, were systematically devalued or outright destroyed by Korra. Let's start with something incredibly simple. The Elements Contrary to what the writers of Korra seem to think, elements were not included in Airbender for the sake of having flashy fight scenes. I mean, it probably didn't hurt, but the actual main point of the elements was to represent different cultures in a really easy to understand way. Each nation has an element associated with it, and the style of the element was also related to the cultural values that nation had. This connection between culture and element meant in order to master all of the elements, the Avatar also had to learn about and understand all of the world's different cultures. This is a critical point giving the Avatar's role as the world's peacekeeper and mediator, and the show really proved that out. Aang had to travel around the world to find people to teach him each element, and in doing so met different people from different cultures related to the element he was learning, and even ended up learning a lot about the problems people were facing and how to best solve them. But Korra completely misses the point here. I mean, to be fair, Season 3 does try to do that, with trying to recreate the airbending culture and people struggling with it, but aside from that, the show doesn't address any themes regarding cultural differences at all. Korra never even tries to help anyone, or learn about the different cultures people are from or anything like that. She herself never really spends any time meeting people of other cultures or talking to anyone outside of her friend group and the world's cultural elite. She never bothers to try to understand non-Bender's points of view, she never really listens to people who don't agree with her ideas, and she barely even tries to solve anybody's problems that don't involve really important people. And this ties into the earlier point that Korra doesn't learn anything or grow in any way, because she really isn't ever exposed to different cultures or even anyone with a different opinion than her that she doesn't end up trying to kill. In Korra, elements just boil down to arbitrary superpowers you use to fight. There are no meaningful cultural differences between benders or even fighting styles between elements. Everyone is pretty much just the generic American citizen, which isn't really bad in and of itself, but it's a complete waste of the Avatar universe. I don't even think you could argue that the whole point of Korra was to show how different cultures integrate into a new society made up of people from all cultures, kind of like how in the US you have immigrants from cultures all over the world living together. Because in Korra, the cultural divide is basically that you're either a bender or you're not. If this were actually like real life, in a new metropolitan city built exclusively out of immigrants, you would likely have different districts devoted to different cultures, and political problems would arise from each culture having different priorities. So even the pathetic attempt Korra makes at a cultural divide between Bender and non-Bender is really weak and gets thrown away towards the end of Season 1 regardless. The show just completely fails to utilize Bending properly. Actually, Korra could take out Bending entirely and replace it with X-Men powers or even just guns and space tech, and nothing would actually change. 
At this point, the show isn't that far off from that anyway, with random characters having random spirit powers or getting abilities that have nothing to do with an original bending, or them just building giant lasers or whatever. Meanwhile, the concept of bending as it is established in Airbender is critical to the entire show, and for the most part there are pretty strict but simple rules for how bending works, and how the world works around it. Bending is ultimately used to create situations that allow the characters to show the full range of who they are. That's what makes it so effective in Airbender, and what makes it so disappointing in Korra. And then there's spirits. While Korra just sort of fails to utilize bending effectively, the show goes out of its way to ruin spirits entirely. Spirits in The Last Airbender are used very deliberately. They exclusively appear in the show to portray how self-centered and destructive humans can be. There are only really six instances of spirits appearing in the entire show. The first is when a spirit attacks a nearby village after the forest it's supposed to protect is burned down from a Fire Nation raid. Pretty self-explanatory there. The second instance is with the moon and ocean spirits, who are both considered necessary for water bending to exist and work together to keep balance over the ocean, or something like that, it's kind of vague. A Fire Nation general who wants to conquer the water tribe kills the moon spirit in order to permanently weaken the water tribe, putting the entire world at risk for his own selfish reasons. In the same episode, while trying to figure out how to help the ocean and moon spirits, Aang travels to the spirit world to meet the face stealer, a spirit who steals people's faces if they show any emotion. This is the only spirit that might have mostly been there to be an obstacle for Aang to pass, but there is an undertone of humans being too reckless and emotionally driven and not thinking things through and constantly getting themselves into trouble as a result. The next instance of spirits was in the Great Library of Wan Shi Tong, which is a library with all of the books and knowledge generated throughout all of history. The librarian is a spirit, and he is extremely wary of humans being in the library, because in the past, every time a human would come, it would only be to figure out how to destroy his or her enemies, to the point where one human even destroyed an entire section of the library to prevent other people from knowing his weaknesses. Eventually, the spirit decides it is too dangerous to give humans any access to the library ever again, so he buries it underground in the middle of a desert forever. The last instance of a spirit is of a spirit who guards a village built on a river, but the river has been polluted horribly by a nearby factory, ruining the village's livelihood and killing all of the local wildlife. When Aang and Kantara destroy the factory and help clean up the river, the spirit thanks them for helping the village when she couldn't. As a side note, even though there aren't explicitly any spirits in it, the swamp is also assumed to be spirit-related, and it's also used to show how the world is all connected and that people don't really think about that enough. But it doesn't have any spirits per se. In all these instances, spirits are used to show how humans destroyed a part of the world, big or small, for their own selfish reasons without considering the consequences of their actions outside of their own bubble. Once again, the point is not to have spirits for the sake of having some mystical force on the show. The spirits are there to be a tangible manifestation for what are otherwise amorphous consequences. And there's actually one more instance of spirits being used that I haven't mentioned. The Avatar. The Avatar's explicit role is to bring balance to the world by mediating conflicts between humans and other humans, and between humans and spirits. The Avatar exists to try to fix the problems humans create. The Avatar also reincarnates every time one dies, and a huge part of being the Avatar is having access to the spirits of past Avatars, so that they can give advice and impart their wisdom on young Avatars growing up all in service of maintaining balance when humans throw the world out of balance. That is the point of spirits. They are specifically in the show to demonstrate how humans are selfish and how they need to be more aware of the consequences of their behaviors. They serve a really important role and aren't overused so that their impact isn't diminished. So what do the writers of The Legend of Korra do with them? They make there be a shitload of spirits that just exist to form hordes of faceless enemies that you can throw at the heroes so you can have a lot of completely pointless fight scenes. Either that, or they're just generic animals that can talk sometimes. On top of that, the show goes on to make something called Spirit Energy, which lets you shoot lasers and open portals and shoot more, bigger lasers. It's also great for when the writers don't know how to fix a problem or what to do with the character, so they can just give them fancy spirit powers and let them do whatever they want. Putting aside the fact that this is textbook bad writing, what frustrates me here is that this actively undermines spirits in the first show. Spirits aren't these special mystical forces beyond our understanding that are meant to keep balance in the world in some unique way, or even just a symbol for the parts of the world humans don't think about enough. According to the legend of Korra, they're just talking animals that sometimes throw themselves at humans so that there can be fight scenes. They don't actually matter that much, at least not any more than the average flying lemur does. Because of Korra, you don't have to take them seriously. And that's not even mentioning how the show just shits on the concept of the Avatar itself. Remember all those things I was saying about the Avatar? How important it was to the central themes of balance and the complexity of human behavior? Well, according to the writers of Korra, that's actually not why there's an Avatar. 
The Avatar exists because thousands of years ago, some random guy decided he wanted to go exploring outside of the realm of humans and bumped into some big spirits fighting each other. Turns out, these are the Spirit of Jesus and the Spirit of Satan, battling in an endless war. Eventually, the Jesus Spirit just gives the guy extra abilities, and now the Avatar has to keep doing things because otherwise evil will rule, and that's bad because evil is bad. So all the bad things in the world are reduced to the Satan Spirit telling people to do bad things. And the Avatar is literally just some Jesus figure who is good and always right. So much for the complexity of human behavior and the importance of balance, right? Being able to split people down the middle into good and evil is exactly what makes a show more dark and mature, and definitely not childish and oversimplified. Then, as if metaphorically killing the Avatar wasn't enough, the show goes on to literally kill the Avatar in the show. Korra, being the useless sack of angst that she is, loses to the bad guy, who the Satan spirit is now working with, and he sucks out the Jesus spirit and proceeds to beat it to death, which for some reason also erases the spirits of all the past avatars. Why was this strictly necessary to do? Why would you go out of your way to just straight up kill the avatar like this? Korra severely underutilized having past avatars anyway, but why would you literally erase it in the canon? If you didn't want to use them, you could have just not used them. But now you had to go out of your way to say, if I don't have the past avatars, nobody gets to have past avatars. And just invalidate a lot of what happened in the first show. I mean, they literally erased it. And the avatar spirits were a major part of the show. They served as Aang's mentors and as an important part of his history and development. They taught Aang things he wouldn't have learned otherwise and gave him advice from different perspectives. That is valuable to the characters. But Korra, totally unprompted, shits in the last airbender's mouth and shoots itself in the foot just to get some cheap emotional reaction from the viewer. In a better show, this maybe could have been justified. But here it doesn't matter because Korra wins the fight anyway and doesn't gain anything from this experience. It just sucks, and now the show ruined another thing that made Airbender really great. At this point, there's nothing left from the soul of the original show that's still standing. The world, which was unique because of the role elements and spirits had in shaping it, has been stripped down to a generic bland fantasy world, and almost none of the characters are in any way engaging or interesting. Incredibly, the creators of a show built around the uniqueness and interconnectedness of its world and the strength of its characters made a sequel that has no trace of either. I just spent about 10,000 words criticizing this show and basically everything it stands for. This show is deeply flawed in fundamental ways, so much so that in some cases it goes out of its way to ruin some of the best parts of things it took from Airbender. I did not enjoy watching most of this show. And yet. Something about The Legend of Korra really resonated with me. There was something so magnetic about the Avatar universe that, even when it's completely mangled in Korra, is still really engaging. I was really sad when I finished the show, because even though I found the characters mostly unlikable and the plot contrived and frustrating, I still really loved the world of Avatar. I also think I haven't given the writers enough credit for Season 3. Really, I think that's the season that saved the show, in my eyes at least. Season 3 took the show back to the formula that made the original series so good. Episodes were mostly self-contained, but still contributing to a season-long arc, and the characters in the show finally had a chance to actually develop, except for Korra, who was mostly just there being loud. The Beifong half-sisters are fantastic. Zhao Fu is an absolutely classic Avatar city, an entire metal city run entirely by metal benders. I loved that. And Tenzin trying to recreate the air nomad culture was also really engaging and interesting, and all the characters felt like they were actually going through something. And Zaheer and the Red Lotus felt actually threatening without being invincible. They had to work really hard to try to kidnap Korra, and they only succeeded by being talented and clever. Their threat felt earned. And that's not to say that season 3 was perfect. The show still had really bad pacing issues, with multiple episodes that basically just served to waste time, and Korra still didn't achieve anything and didn't even need to be there for the entire season. But at least there were a lot of good parts to it, which is more than I can say for any other season of the show. If the entire show had been along the lines of season 3, I honestly think I would have felt satisfied with the show. But it's not and the show ends up being mostly a mess of bad ideas and poor execution. And look, we can argue about whether the writers deserve any credit for coming up with challenging ideas that are in theory darker and more interesting than what Airbender tackled, but when it comes down to it, they completely and utterly fail to follow through on any of those ideas. It's not hard to come up with a dark and edgy storyline that mirrors real-world events. I would know, I did it constantly as a teenager, and I wasn't that smart or creative. Ideas are cheap, executing them is the real hard part and the only thing that actually matters. The idea of a teenager with special powers learning to develop those powers to kill an evil king isn't unique or special, but the way Avatar The Last Airbender told that story made the show transcendent and one of the greatest stories ever told. And Korra, for all of the things it could have had going for it, just told a bad story. <laughs>